<laughs> so um, I'd like to introduce our our, our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Don Desjardins. Uh, Dr. Desjardins, and I didn't wear, put my glasses on. <laughs> no, I guess. Uh, there he is. Um, he is a professor of psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and guest investigator at Rockefeller University. Will it, he will address the behavioral dynamics of reducing HIV transmission among persons who inject drugs and the political dynamics of implementing evidence-based programs. And, and Dr. Dave Arley is a, he's actually a pioneer in this work and he's uh, internationally renowned. And I think at one point he was working in like 40 countries, but I'll let him speak. Thank you, Bill. I'm very pleased to be here, uh, particularly with the route I took to get here, uh, which started in Hanoi, went through Hong Kong for several days, got stuck in uh, San Francisco on the way out here, but I'm here and very, very happy to be here. Um, uh, so I will uh, review the New York City uh, epidemic. Okay. Uh, but first, I need to mention a large number of colleagues, particularly Sam Friedman, Michael Marmer, Donna Milvan, Stan Yankovitz, Kamiar Ariste, Courtney McKnight, and Mary Jean Creek, who have uh, worked with me uh, on this research over time and particularly want to acknowledge the support of the New York City Department of Health including Commissioners David Sensor, Steve Joseph, Tom Frieden, and Mary Bassett. Uh, the New York City Department of Health put a lot of resources into this research, particularly uh, CD4 cell counts, uh, back when CD4 cell counts were very, very expensive to do. Uh, wrong button. Yeah, I pushed a wrong button here and it it's escape works. Okay. Uh, New York City has experienced the world's largest HIV epidemic among uh, people who inject drugs. Uh, there have been over 60,000 cases of AIDS among people who inject drugs and over 100,000 HIV infections. And uh, both of those are actually uh, undercounts because uh, in the early days there was a lack of HIV testing. Uh, there was, was a very, very high death rate so that people died uh, before they got counted in any way. And the early definitions of AIDS were based on the syndrome in men who have sex with men and did not capture all of the manifestations of HIV infection among people who inject drugs. Uh, examples would include the increased rate of endocarditis, uh, increased rates of tuberculosis, uh, particularly tuberculosis outside of the lungs, all of which were happening in association with HIV infection and severe immunosuppression among people who use drugs and were not caught in those early uh, case definitions for AIDS. So that the actual numbers are probably at least 50 times, 50% uh, higher uh, among people who inject drugs than the official uh, HIV AIDS data. Okay. Uh, most of this data comes from what we call our risk factor study. Uh, it was originally uh, DA 03574. Those of you who are familiar with NIH classification systems will note that there are only five digits in this number. <laughs> this study was actually funded before they needed six digits in their uh, classification. Uh, the proposal was originally written in 1982. It was funded on the first submission started in 1983 and has been continuously renewed 
uh, every five years. It is now in grant years 31 to 35. Uh, and so let's try escape again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So fortunately, we have had continuous funding of this study, uh, of this grant, and it has allowed us to really capture the entire history of the HIV epidemic in New York City. Uh, the original purpose of the study was to find out how AIDS was transmitted. The study started before HIV was discovered, before there was an antibody test, uh, everybody suspected that it was bloodborne, um, although nobody was really certain of that. Um, there were questions about why do some drug users have AIDS and others don't. Uh, at the time, there were only a small percentage of, of uh, people who used drugs who had uh, AIDS, and there was questions of are the drugs contributing to the immunosuppression? Are they contributing to the progression of, of infections? Were there specific behaviors that increase the likelihood that you would develop AIDS so that if those specific behaviors, other than just sharing needles and syringes, might be modified to reduce the chances that you would get infected? And then as the grant has continued, we have looked at new developments in HIV infection among people who use drugs in New York. Uh, that includes the effects of various interventions, including our large syringe exchange programs, and has looked at sexual transmission of HIV from drug users to their sexual partners, and particularly sexual transmission of HIV among non-injecting uh, drug users. That, Currently, our HIV prevalence among non-injecting drug users is slightly higher than our HIV prevalence among people who inject drugs. Uh, and our modeling indicates that about 70 to 80 percent of infections among people who inject drugs are due to sexual transmission. So one of the things that has happened over the time is that it's gone from being an injecting-related epidemic to really a sexual transmission epidemic. Okay. Uh, the purpose, the current purpose of this grant is getting close to zero new HIV infections among people who inject drugs. Uh, getting to zero, as you know, is the official goal for UN AIDS. Uh, we would like to think that uh, close that zero new infections might be realistic. We don't really think that that is realistic. So part of this grant is looking at how close to zero new infections can you get in a very large, diverse population of 100,000 people who inject and probably 200,000 people who use drugs through non-injecting uh, routes of administration. Uh, as part of the grant proposal, we set a goal of close to zero as an incidence rate of 0 0.5 per 100 person years of uh, risk. And the other part of this uh, current part, current study is what can we do to avoid new outbreaks of HIV transmission, particularly with the people who are transitioning from opiate analgesics to injecting heroin. We have a very substantial number of those people out in the suburbs and on Staten Island. And I understand you have a lot of those people here in North Carolina also. Okay. Uh, the methods of the study is that we interview 600 to 800 people per year entering the Beth Israel detoxification and methadone programs. The, we have a questionnaire on demographics, drug use, and sexual behavior. The questionnaire covers these basically the six months before they come into drug treatment, so it's capturing periods of pretty high use of drugs. We also do uh, HIV, hepatitis C virus, and herpes simplex virus type 2 uh, counseling and testing for all subjects. Uh, this is a reconstruction of the uh, epidemic among people who inject drugs in New York City, 
showing different time periods. The uh, years on the bottom are not particularly clear, uh, but okay. Uh, the bars in red start in 1976. We actually had stored sera at Rockefeller University from people who inject drugs and were seen for liver problems in, in the years uh, 76 through 1980. So we have we had access to HIV infection prior to the official discovery of AIDS. And so we, you know, once the antibody test was developed, we went back and tested that sera. And you can see a very rapid rise in HIV prevalence from 8% in 76 up to about 50% in 1980. So that there was this period of extremely rapid transmission of HIV before anybody knew what was going on. Uh, in analyzing this and other epidemics of rapid transmission, we have identified four factors associated with rapid transmission of HIV among people who inject drugs. First is the absence of knowledge of AIDS, HIV as a local threat. Obviously, in New York in the late 70s, there was no knowledge of HIV as a threat to the population. So nobody knew about it. Nobody was doing anything to change their behavior. The second important factor was the limitation on access to sterile injection equipment. Uh, that is still present in many parts of the world. Uh, in New York at the time, uh, there was a legal requirement for purchasing needles and syringes that you had to have a prescription to purchase at a pharmacy. Syringe exchange wasn't even thought of. Uh, and people could be arrested for narcotics paraphernalia. Uh, the third component was the high frequencies of uh, drug injecting behavior. At New New York, in New York at that time, there was a lot of heroin injection, but there was also an awful lot of cocaine injection. And people injecting cocaine would often inject 10, 15 times, 20 times an evening until they ran out of cocaine. And so if they were injecting in groups, there would often be one or maybe two needles just spread, uh, used in the group with lots of people uh, injecting. And then the final factor is large injection risk networks with rapid partner change. Uh, this included the, the classic shooting galleries where I would go in, I would rent the needle and syringe, I would inject with it, it would then be rinsed out in water that contained a lot of blood, and the needle and syringe would then be rented to the next person to come in. So if I went to a shooting gallery three times a day, I could be sharing with three different people every day. Uh, another aspect of this is dealer's works, where people selling drugs would often keep a needle and syringe available to rent to their customers. So again, you could be sharing with many, many different people within a very, very short time period. Okay. Then the second stage, uh, shown as yellow in yellow, uh, was from about 1981-82 through 1990. Uh, this was where HIV prevalence basically stabilized uh, among people who injected drugs in the city at about 50 to 60 percent. Uh, drug users became aware of AIDS. They made the analogy to hepatitis B and believe that it, accurately believed that it was spread through sharing injection equipment. So this led to changes in behavior. They reduced their sharing networks. The market, illicit market for needles and syringes increased dramatically. Uh, our field unit came across examples of people selling syringes with get the good needles, don't get bad AIDS. So there was clear community awareness 
that you needed to quit sharing, that you needed to try to use your own needles and syringes. And so uh, during this period, prevalence stabilized at a, an incidence rate of about four per hundred person years at risk. Uh, clearly, the community reaction was quite positive, but not sufficient. Uh, so here, the, there, uh, there was local knowledge. We took care of that factor. And the large injection risk networks declined. So that of the four factors, two of them were reduced during this period of stabilization. Uh, but we still had limitations on access to sterile injecting equipment, and we still had a fair amount of cocaine injecting with the high uh, injection frequencies. Then in green, uh, we have the period of a pretty rapid decline in both incidence and prevalence. Uh, this is where we actually did legalize and fund syringe exchange programs. There was a very, very intense debate around this. There was opposition among our ethnic minority communities, particularly African Americans. Uh, at the time, uh, during the uh, 80s, we did have a crack cocaine epidemic going on, and it was uh, marked by extreme violence uh, in the distribution networks with drive-by shootings. And the community was uh, justifiably upset about all of that violence. So when we said, why don't we have syringe exchange and give people clean needles and syringes, the reaction was, why don't you do something about crack cocaine and the violence? Then after you do that, we'll think about doing something positive for people who use drugs. Uh, but it, uh, during those days, it was extremely difficult to uh, propose any public health measure to protect the lives of drug users and the communities that they lived in. Uh, when, Steve, when the uh, health commissioner proposed doing syringe exchange, he was accused of genocide uh, for the black community. But as the epidemic rolled on with high rates of prevalence and high rates of AIDS, it, there was uh, an eventual recognition that something had to be done. Uh, the particularly John Daniel of uh, New Haven, Connecticut visited uh, the pediatric AIDS ward in uh, the hospitals in New Haven and saw all of these young babies dying of AIDS. And as an African American, he felt that was just totally unacceptable to have all of these young babies dying of AIDS. And so he changed his opposition from syringe exchange to support for syringe exchange. And once he did that, it set a positive example for the African American community that you could change your attitudes towards syringe exchange. And that allowed New York City to follow the example of New Haven. Okay. New York City syringe exchange programs, we have some nice flashy white lines somehow, but uh, anyway. Uh, in late 1992, the uh, syringe exchange programs were legally authorized and received state funding uh, in New York. And so we went from about 250,000 syringes distributed per year in the 90 to 92 period. This is when we had uh, underground syringe exchange done by activists. Uh, they were uh, effective uh, as far as they went. Uh, the activists did get themselves arrested and uh, went to court. They were uh, came up with a not guilty 
uh, verdict be because of a public health necessity uh, defense. Uh, but it still took a few years before the government uh, changed its position. When the government did change its position, we had a rapid expansion in the number of syringes being distributed. So we went from 250,000 per year in the 90 to 92 period up to about 3 million per year uh, about five or six years later. So we, we did have a very, very rapid expansion of our syringe exchange programs. During this time, we saw a very, very dramatic drop in HIV incidence. As I mentioned, the risk factors study was collecting sera all this time, and we had that stored, and we were able to look at that sera using the STARS test, uh, serologic test algorithm for uh, recent HIV infection to identify uh, new, new infections. And we also had uh, CD4 cell count data on all of these subjects. So we were able to differentiate people who were STARS positive because they had been infected for a long period of time with low CD4 counts as opposed to people who were recently infected. And so the incidents went from about 3.8 per 100 person years at risk down to about 0.8 per 100 person years at risk as our syringe exchange programs expanded. So a, a very dramatic reduction in HIV incidence associated with the very dramatic reduction in uh, the numbers of syringes distributed. For those of you who look at statistics, this was actually a, a Pearson product moment correlation of 0.99. So I'm proud to say that I published an almost perfect correlation. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, during this period, we basically got rid of all of these rapid transmission factors. People knew about HIV and AIDS. There was, we removed the limitations on access to sterile and injection equipment. Cocaine injection actually went down for reasons beyond our control. And the large injection risk networks uh, were basically broken up. Uh, we did have one uh, scientific conference presentation saying, where have all the, where have all the shooting galleries gone? because we had enough syringes being distributed that people didn't have to go to commercial uh, places to rent needles and syringes. Just basically the clean needles and syringes were out there. They were mostly being distributed by the drug users themselves, that uh, more than half of the syringes going out for, from the syringe exchanges were going out through secondary exchange that people would come in and they would exchange four or 500 needles and syringes at one time, and then they would go out and do exchange work uh, within their peer networks. Uh, originally, this was against our state regulations. Uh, everybody knew it was happening and approved of it being happening, uh, but the original authorizing regulations said you were supposed to do exchange only for your own personal use. So after a few years of the uh, dependence upon secondary exchange, we started pro, uh, essentially licensing people doing this syringe exchange, enrolled them as peer exchangers, and officially permitted them to do syringe exchange. Okay. Uh, that basically gets us through this third stage of a rapid decline in HIV prevalence. Uh, during this period, as I mentioned, incidence went from about four per hundred person years at risk to under one per hundred person years uh, at risk. Then around uh, 2000, we started with 
antiretroviral treatment for people who use drugs. And we then saw a brief increase in prevalence as the death rate went down. Uh, it has now started to decline again as um, the incidence rate has gone way down. And of course, this reflects the active injecting population. And there are always people leaving the active injecting population, not only because of deaths and HIV related deaths, because, but simply because some of them go into treatment and they uh, quit injecting. Uh, there are also, of course, deaths and disability from non-AIDS factors. Uh, we've gotten very good at testing uh, people who inject drugs for HIV, going from about two-thirds in 1990 up to uh, about 90%, uh, about, I mean, 80% in around 2000, and I don't have a bar showing it, but we're now up to 98, 99% of people who've been tested for HIV, and many of them test every six months to every 12 months, so that we basically uh, tested almost everybody. Okay. Uh, this is some of our recent test results uh, from 2000 to 2014. You note that we do have very uh, different rates among different demographic groups, that it was 11% uh, prevalence among non-MSM males, 26% among MSM males, 16% among females who inject, 7% among whites, 13% among uh, Latinos and 23% among African Americans. So that we do have very important gender and racial ethnic uh, disparities in HIV prevalence. These actually reflect disparities that have existed since the start of the epidemic. Back in the, the historically collected blood from 76 to 1980, we did see strong racial ethnic disparities back then. Uh, and these have really continued up through the present. However, when we looked at our most recent data about providing antiretroviral treatment to HIV positive uh, people who inject, we saw no gender and racial ethnic disparities that even though there were uh, very strong disparities in prevalence in terms of people who were on ART, there were no significant gender and race ethnic disparities. The only factors uh, significant in this multivariate analysis were the year of interview, the later the interview, the more likely you were to be on ART and age, the older you are, the uh, the more likely you had a longer HIV infection, the more likely you were to be on ART. And we saw an increase among uh, HIV positives receiving ART from approximately 50% uh, to 75% up to uh, our most recent data. So that uh, we are doing a good job of identifying and uh, HIV positive people who inject drugs and getting them on ART. Uh, this shows data on prevalence among uh, injectors and non injectors, and then and on the top line, and then the bottom line in each of these graphs are people who are HIV positive and not on ART. So you can see basically parallel curves that as prevalence has been going down, the number of people who are HIV positive and not on ART, the bottom lines in these two graphs have been going down even faster. So in terms of getting people on ART, we saw a significant uptake from 2000 
to 2014. And this was getting people on ART despite very, very active drug injection habits. These were people who were voluntarily coming into treatment because they couldn't maintain their drug use on the street. So that these were not pure, pristine people who had quit using drugs. These were very, very active drug users who were still getting on ART. We attribute this to reductions in individual provider and system level barriers to getting uh, people who inject drugs on to ART. We have worked with providers to deal with the stigmatization of drug users. We have uh, done system uh, changes. The City Department of Health has announced a policy that they want to get all HIV positives on ART. This was ahead of the CDC change in their uh, recommendations. And the City Health Department announced a goal that 80% of newly diagnosed people with HIV infection would be at viral suppression within 12 months of diagnosis. So that uh, there's a real effort to get all HIV positives onto ART, help them with adherence issues, and get them to viral suppression. Uh, we do have another grant uh, working with the City Health Department to try to get people who use drugs to viral suppression. Right now, we're at about 60 to 70 percent of people who use drugs are newly diagnosed with HIV, achieving viral suppression within that 12-month uh, framework. The city is and the state are clearly putting a lot of resources into getting people uh, onto ART and to viral suppression. So uh, we currently estimate, based on New York City Department of Health surveillance data, that about 75% of people who inject drugs who are on ART are at viral suppression. Okay. Uh, this may be the most informative single graph of the ending of the HIV epidemic uh, among people who inject drugs in New York City. This shows people at risk of transmitting HIV. They are HIV positive, not on ART, and engage in distributing sharing, passing on their used needles uh, and syringes. And the denominator for this is the total injecting population. And you can see that in 1990, that was close to 30%. We're now down very, very close to zero people at risk for transmitting HIV through needles and syringes. Okay. Uh, once you do get down close to zero new infections, you come across the big problem of how do you really know how many new infections have you got? You can't run cohort studies because cohort studies are basically too big and expensive to measure very, very low rates of HIV incidence. So our next research task was try to try to find out ways of measuring very, very low incidence to see how close to zero we could get and to detect any possible resurgence of HIV infection. We used four different methods. One was based on the risk factors study. Because we enroll people every year, we get a number of people who repeat, who enroll in the study, cross-sectional study, one year, but then they come back a year or two later with continuing drug problems, and we recapture them in the study. So that we had a decent number of people, about 1,100, who had been in the study more than once and who were HIV negative at their first enrollment in the study. We also looked at the slope of the curve of HIV prevalence among people who had just started injecting. 
people who injected for less than one year, one to two years, two to three years, three to four, four to five, and took the slope of that curve, the change in prevalence by years injecting, as an indication of incidence. Uh, we've used this in a number of different uh, areas, and it does seem to be a pretty good method for estimating HIV incidence uh, among people just starting to inject. You, uh, the regression equation will give you a constant, which is basically the HIV prevalence among people just starting before they start injecting, but then you look at the increase uh, over time. Uh, you have to do this with relatively short time periods so that people who are positive do not drop out of the uh, population at risk. The third method we used was the stratified uh, extrapolation method, uh, serologic uh, estimation algorithm from the CDC, uh, and used the New York State Department of Health uh, data. Uh, this is a very computationally intensive modeling effort where they take BED testing and information on HIV testing behavior among different strata. The strata are by transmission group, age, gender, race, ethnicity, uh, specific areas where you live. There are potentially up to about 20 different strata uh, in this method that you use to generate uh, estimates of new infections. We then use the uh, estimate of the number of new infections and divided by our estimate of the number of people who inject drugs in New York State. And the fourth method was simply the number of newly diagnosed cases of HIV among people who inject drugs in New York City. Uh, we did exclude people who had an AIDS diagnosis within uh, a month of their HIV diagnosis, because those clearly were not new infection, and we divided these numbers of newly identified cases by our estimate of the injecting population uh, in the city. So we had four methods, two of them based on our risk factor study, one based on statewide surveillance and the CDC modeling work, and one based on a simple count of people newly, in fact, uh, newly identified in New York City. We found a surprising consistency in these methods, uh, much more consistency than we uh, had uh, expected. For the years 2000 to 2014, method one gave us 0 0.37 for 100 person years at risk, method two, 0 0.61, method three, 0 0.32, and method four, 0.14 per 100 person years at risk. They're with considerable overlap in all of the confidence intervals. We also looked at more recent data, 2011 to 2014. We had three me methods for estimating this. The uh, repeat participants in risk factors and the state and city cases of new uh, HIV, newly diagnosed HIV uh, infections. The rate for this more recent period of time in the three methods ranged from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. I mean, it ranged from 0, 0.0 uh, in the re repeat uh, participants. We actually had no new HIV infections in about 400 person years at risk, uh, and a mean estimate of 0 0.1 per 100 person years at risk. So uh, among these four methods, there were no outliers. There was uh, no one estimate was either higher or lower than the others. The estimates ranged from 0. 1.4 to uh, 0 0.61 for the 2000 to 2000 period, 2000 to 2014 period. There was overlap among 
all of the confidence intervals. The three methods for which we were able to examine trends over time all showed declines uh, over time. And these, the consistency in these results suggests that all four methods are really capturing the same phenomenon of low and decreasing HIV incidence among people who inject drugs uh, in New York. Okay. So uh, when we first implemented combined prevention and care, by starting our large-scale syringe exchanges back in the early 1990s, 1992 to 1993, we saw a decline in incidence from about four per 100 person years at risk to the current 0 0.1 per 100 person years at risk. That's a reduction of 97.5% of incidence. So by uh, we consider this to be a really major public health success, that we haven't really eliminated new HIV infections among people who inject drugs, but we've come remarkably close. And I really want to emphasize that it was the behavior change and the altruism of people who inject drugs that was a critical component of this success. They went, people who went out talked to their peers, their drug injecting peers about HIV. They supplied clean needles and syringes to their peers. They encouraged their peers to get tested for HIV and to go on ART. This was not just a public health uh, department effort. This was really community behavior change within the population who in inject drugs. That prior to AIDS, Lending your needles and syringes was seen as a pro-social act because needles and syringes were so scarce. With HIV, encouraging your peers to not share, giving your peers clean needles and syringes, encouraging them to be tested, encouraging them to get on ART were the pro-social acts. And we, of course, believe that we need to continue uh, these harm reduction programs. We are, as I mentioned, faced with a large number of new people starting to inject uh, drugs, uh, going from opiate analgesics to injecting heroin, uh, and so that we need to maintain these programs and we need to work to make sure that they're reaching uh, these new populations of people who inject drugs, that we have this remarkable success story in reducing HIV incidence, and we don't want to slip back because the programs aren't reaching the new populations of people starting to inject drugs. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, Wendy. Thanks, Don, for a great talk and all the years of the work that you've done. And this was a really clear story. Um, so I have one comment and two questions. New York City has been a real laboratory for not just the community activism, but tremendous amount of research. I so um, I would say that getting down to zero has also been all of our friends who have been doing a tremendous amount of research there as well as the laboratory of the one place that's been an epicenter of IDUs. So um, I want to make that as a comment. Oh, okay. The other thing is just from my experience with the IDUs when even I was a tr treatment director, is the hepatitis C and drinking among injectors is a problem. And the cost of treatment is a problem. And I just, I know you didn't mention it and I know you know a lot about it and I know it's been Bill's work as well. But hepatitis is still a problem. And the other question I have is, um, from our own experience, adherence, reaching them now for um, art is extremely important, but adherence over time while you still have active addiction seems to still be a problem. Could you comment on both those questions? Uh, two questions, okay. The hepatitis C is clearly the dominant health problem among, among people who inject drugs now. We have many, many poor pe more people dying of hepatitis C infection than of HIV infection. And NIDA hasn't caught on to that yet, 
so they're not funding hepatitis C research at the level uh, of HIV research. Uh, the city and state health departments are throwing in uh, a modest amount of money. It's more than spare change, but it's not what's really needed to uh, deal with the hepatitis C problem. Uh, and the cost of the new drugs is unconscionable. Uh, we have done back of the envelope calculations and figure that it's cheaper to take somebody and fly them to Egypt and have them treated for hepatitis C infection at the drug prices there and then fly them back uh, after a couple months than to try treating them uh, in New York City. Uh, and in terms of adherence, we're actually getting pretty good adherence among people who inject drugs. One of the strategies that uh, our providers use is to ask somebody who is, say, injecting drugs three times a day, well, what do you do first thing in the morning? Well, I go find my first shot to get straight. And the provider then says, well, when you take that first shot to get straight, take your HIV medication at the same time. And so that you try to link in taking the medication with the behavior patterns of people who are using drugs. And when they make those linkages, they actually adhere pretty well. Uh, the other aspect is that if they don't adhere very well, they tend to really just drop out. So you don't get the drug resistance problem that comes from inconsistent taking of the HIV medication. They're either really adhering pretty well or they've dropped off taking medication at all. And then you catch them again coming back into treatment when they start to get sick. So it's not perfect adherence, but we don't see a lot of antiretroviral resistance developing. And our providers are really trying to work with the people's lifestyles and build taking the medication into their lifestyles rather than insisting a total change in lifestyle, which is, would be very, very difficult and require a lot more resources. But if you can make that linkage of, okay, when I do my first shot to get straight, I will take the, my HIV medication, uh, you do get pretty good errands. Uh, yes. Okay. Here comes the mic. Hi, I just have a minor question. Do, does the Department of Public Health or you guys use RNA testing or just ELISA to find HIV at this point? Uh, the providers do uh, the, uh, the hepatitis C. Uh, did you ask about hepatitis C and RNA or HIV viral load testing or both? Okay, uh, we're working on paying for the uh, HCV uh, RNA testing, and we're sort of trying to shovel it into the Affordable Care Act, uh, and that's working in some of uh, some places. That I know my methadone program has now tested 6,000 people for HCV antibody, and all of those who came up antibody positive were given RNA testing. Uh, and now the big issue is getting them to treatment and paying for treatment. But we are using the Affordable Care Act to do the RNA testing. Uh, and we're thinking of various ways of trying to get them treated, uh, patient navigation to get them to the uh, hepatitis C clinics and possibly telemedicine so that they could get their HCV treatment in their methadone program without having to wander across the city to find a hepatitis uh, clinic. So that's really the, that and the cost are the areas where we're working, trying to uh, deal with hepatitis C. That will undoubtedly be a harder problem than HIV because hepatitis C is so easily transmitted and the prevalence of hepatitis C is now about 70% among people who inject. That's down from the 90 plus hepatitis C prevalence before we started our syringe exchange program 
but it's still unacceptably high. Uh, and so somebody who's successfully treated for hepatitis C infection and continues to inject is at possible risk for uh, reinfection. Yes. Um, at the end of your presentation, you pointed out that there are some significant differences between people who are starting to use um, injecting, injecting drugs now as they're transitioning from um, like an opiate pain medication to injecting drugs and the people that were studied throughout this process and that you've really targeted through these interventions. You also mentioned that one of the major successes or major points for success in your intervention was the community that surrounded the intervention and how the people who were using drugs actually facilitated that intervention. And so I wondered if you could speak to how there may be a difference in the community between the people that we previously saw using injected drugs and those who are joining the community now and how your interventions might change based on that. Uh, they'll change quite a bit. Uh because those are really demographically very different uh, communities. The African-American in central Harlem versus the white uh, opiate analgesic user in, on Staten Island don't see each other very often. Uh, so we're uh, adapting interventions. Uh, we have a project trying to reduce initiation into injecting the transition from opiate analgesics to injecting. That involves working with current injectors in the neighborhood so that they don't model injecting behavior, they don't talk up the wonders of the high from injecting, and they don't teach people how to in inject. Uh, and that seems to be going really quite well because when you talk to, even on Staten Island, when you talk to people who inject, they say, it ruined my life. Of course, I won't teach somebody else how to inject. Uh, we've only come across actually a couple people who are currently injecting who say that they would teach somebody else or they have taught somebody else. Uh, we're also working with people who haven't started to inject uh, using motivational interviewing techniques so that they don't start injecting. Again, we don't want to be directive and say, you shouldn't start to inject, but we interview them and talk to them about, well, how would you feel if you started injecting? How would your friends and relatives feel if, you, if they found out you were injecting? Uh, what are the, your reasons for not starting to inject? And also we work on trying to get them into drug treatment because one of the reasons for the transition to injecting among these opiate analgesic users is they can't afford the cost of the pills. And so we try to get them into low threshold detoxification programs. They don't have to commit to never using drugs for the rest of their life, which is probably an unrealistic commitment. But we want to try to get their tolerance down to where they can afford to not inject. Uh, that project is uh, in its first year, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the people who are at high risk for injecting, starting to inject, are a very hidden population. Uh, we're trying to reach them through naloxone distribution, through community outreach and such, but they are very, very closeted about their drug use uh, so that we tend to catch them after they've started injecting rather than just before. Uh, but we're working on what, new ways of trying to reach people using opiate analgesics. Uh, again, I mentioned our naloxone distribution programs, catch some of them. We work with parent groups because parents are very concerned about their young adults who are using uh, opiate analgesics and such. But the, the idea is that we for those people, we really want to reduce initiation into injecting. Uh, we will, of course, work on providing them clean syringes if they do need clean syringes. But the goal of that project is really to reduce the transition into injecting. Uh, my name is Robert Childs. I'm the executive director of North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. And if folks in the room aren't aware of it, 
we've actually passed five pieces of harm reduction legislation through the Republicans in North Carolina, uh, allowing for greater naloxone distribution, decriminalizing drugs at drug overdoses, um, small amounts only, and then also decrimming syringes and legalizing biohazard collection in the state. In 2016 session this year, we'll be running a Republican syringe exchange bill. And since there's many of you in this room who have status in the community, we're hoping that you will not hide all the great information about syringe exchange and that you'll actually stand up in favor of it. So if any of you are willing to write op-eds, talk to your legislator, uh, write to your legislator, visit your legislator, and do issue education, there's nothing banning you from doing issue, edu educa issue education as somebody employee of ours at TI. You can actually talk to them about it, you just can't tell them to support a bill. So. That is something I highly encourage all of you to do because you all are part of our academic leaders across the state and across the nation and to not stand up for evidence-based interventions is ridiculous. And so I hope that you will consider doing that. And if any of you need any coaching, uh, Lofton and I are both here today and happy to talk to you about it. So I'll leave with that. Okay. Uh, one thing to add to that is once we get the, our interventions to fully reduce initiation into injecting, we hope to bring them to North Carolina where there's clearly a need. Yes. I think you need the mic because it's being recorded. I used to, I used to in New York, work with the Dr. Jeffrey Reynolds. We passed a lot of laws in New York. Uh, and going after prescription drugs problems with doctors as well. We tried a program called the, from the Menendez Foundation, which was called Too, too, uh, too Much to Fail. And uh, it, what it did was it reduced a great deal of the interventions, replacing their program that's now present, which doesn't work very well, and uh, fund this into the uh, public school system. And uh, hit it before it becomes a problem later on in life, so at least you have some inoculation uh, to deal with the social aspects of the disease. Do you think uh, North Carolina is able to handle the upcoming, or at least the law enforcement able to handle the upcoming uh, epidemic of uh, heroin, which is starting to take hold here? I would say North Carolina has a fighting chance of being able to handle it. Uh, fighting because it will take a lot of political effort uh, to do it, but uh, in my understanding, North Carolina has one of the most uh, successful naloxone distribution programs of any state in the country, and that can be an opening into the communities where these transition to uh, heroin injecting are occurring. Uh, it gives you tr trust with people using drugs, that you're actually doing something to help them and not just going to throw them in jail. So I, I think that North Carolina has some real advantages compared to states that haven't done naloxone distribution and a uh, basically, as I understand it, basically supportive political leadership in the state. Um, but it get, it's going to take a lot of effort obviously, which is really why I would say a fighting chance of doing it. Thank you. So we have an online question from Mojjan Zare, who would like to know, one, uh, if your slides uh, can be made available, and two, uh, he uh, said, in your previous studies, what was the actual stats on drug use actually worsening the course of HIV AIDS and the findings? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can make the um, slides available. I can also, all of this data is either published or in press, so I can provide the references uh, for it also. Uh, and in terms of did drug use get better or worse during these 30 years, um, I would say it changed rather than getting better or worse. We did see the crack cocaine epidemic, which had a lot of very harmful social consequences in terms of community violence. It had HIV consequences in that there was a lot of sexual transmission of uh, HIV among people using crack. 
Uh, we were remarkably successful in reducing HIV among people who inject. It now looks like we're going to have comparable success in reducing HIV, uh, sexually transmitted HIV among people who use crack. Uh, that paper is currently under review. Um, and we've, we're now seeing this new generation of people going from opiate analgesics to injecting. So there have been a lot of changes in the drug use patterns during the last 30 years in New York. And I'm not sure I would say it's better or worse. Uh, clearly, the HIV situation is better. Clearly, we don't have the amount of violence uh, associated with uh, drug distribution that we had during the uh, 1980s. So things are better that way. But in terms of the number of people with substance use disorders, that is possibly even increasing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a simple better or worse uh, given all of those changes. And, and do the drugs actually worsen the course of HIV and life expectancy? Uh, there is very, there is some evidence of a possible worsening, but it's very, very mild, if anything. Um, there's some evidence that non-sterile injections may increase immune activation, which may promote uh, HIV replication, but it would seem to be a very, very minor uh, effect. HIV is a sledgehammer to the immune system, and if you tap on it a little bit with a uh, knife or fork, it doesn't make much difference compared to that sledgehammer that HIV is doing to the uh, immune system. Uh, the bigger issue is probably adherence to your HIV medications while using drugs, uh, so that if your drug use is interfering, with adherence, then you are more likely to develop HIV disease than uh, if you're not using drugs. Um, there was a rapid outbreak of HIV in a small town in Indiana last year. Uh, do you think we'll be seeing more of that? And if so, are there ways to either prevent it or respond quickly? Uh, I think we will be seeing more of that because in terms of implementing evidence-based HIV prevention throughout the United States, there's still a lot of areas that are very, very far behind. Uh, I don't know that there are many as bad as Indiana was with uh, where syringe exchange was illegal at the time that that HIV outbreak occurred. Uh, they were injecting short acting opiates, so multiple times per day, and they had pretty close to one large injecting network uh, in uh, the city. So that of those, and they were, the drug users were not really aware of HIV. They're, the, the HIV testing had been shut down. The one place that was doing it in the, in the town was shut down. So all of those four factors for rapid transmission were there in spades. Uh, there probably you know, are other uh, counties in the US that have all four, but because of that outbreak, we're seeing some political change. We now have permission to use federal funds for syringe exchange. We're seeing uh, states like Kentucky have authorized syringe exchange. They haven't really funded it yet, but they've authorized it. So uh, I think, you know, there's a chance that a number of communities will be able to avert HIV outbreaks. But I think that the, you know, the statistical odds are that we are going to have more outbreaks like that because of the large number of uh, places that are just totally unprepared for HIV. Okay, thank you.